So let's take a look at a few um, other issues about plumbing systems that we should be aware of as architects when we have discussions with engineers and plumbers and those uh, trade people that we'll be working with. Um, in this case, um, I'm going to cover a couple of ideas about valve systems. You should understand the term a gate valve. A gate valve is a, um, a valve that can create a complete um, closure and shut off of the water flow. Um, but it has the other advantage of being able to allow unrestricted flow. The gate gets totally out of the way, and that'll be a comparison to some other valves that I show you um, coming coming along. Uh, these are really typically used in um, municipal water supply systems and in controlling uh, things like sewage during storm events where you may want to prevent it from backing up um, when the storm system can no longer accept um, discharges. One of the most common valves we'll run into, a relatively high quality valve, is a ball valve. It's a shut off valve. It's very dependable. It's dependable because of the nature of its design. This ball, the steel ball, is very smooth and the, and the, um, the um, uh, grommets or bushings that surround it can be very carefully controlled so that they can both generate a really um, complete shut off of the water. Um, they can be used repeatedly without wearing out. Um, so they're really a, a valve of choice. They can control supplies to um, the hot water tank, to uh, heating systems, to the water coming into the building. Uh, in comparison, we have a stop valve. A stop valve is a relatively old um, style of valve. And in this case, is your old designs. The idea is you have a rubber um, washer that can shut off the flow of water. It's subject to wear and leakage. Um, the gland that keeps the water from leaking out of the shaft is also subject to leakage, so these can be very high maintenance items. So their use is somewhat discouraged. Um, and they also restrict flow because of this idea of um, the, um, the amount of openings that's provided with respect to the size of the pipes that come through them. So um, those shutoff valves, in this case, these are probably um, shutoff, uh, these could be ball valves, but in many cases they're um, just stop valves. Um, very common um, to find underneath a sink. So here we are, uh, for example, let's say making a kitchen inspection. We look under the sink. We can see that the supply lines have been run to the sink. We see that properly they have put stop valves in. If these are missing, it would mean that the homeowner would have to turn all the water off in order to replace or repair the fixture up above. So um, a mark of good quality installation is to have these stop valves at each fixture so that they can be the fixture can be maintained. We have the drain line. This is a two bowl sink. So the two combine and go out a single outlet and there should be a trap here, which prevents the sewer gases from entering the space, as we've discussed before. So um, one of the things that's, um, I guess, in, come into codes is being required more often than it used to be is this idea of a backflow preventer valve. This is the idea of, of breaking the flow of water in the opposite direction from the supply. And you would say, how could that ever happen? Um, but that can happen in... Um, damage to the exterior water supplies to the building. So instant, for instance, this is a municipal water main. There's a rupture in the system. We've all had, we've lived in older cities. You'll know that these will cause low pressure situations. And that low pressure situation can allow um, anyone that's hooked up to the system to back siphon um, liquids into the, um, to the supply system. And if that, if that back siphoning happens to be a, a sink or tub or a container filled with a pathogen or a poison, it can be um, uh, sucked into the supply line. And when pressure is returned, that water then can contaminate any of the um, residences or commercial buildings that are associated with it. So this idea of a backflow prevention valve is a really important and useful function. It used to be, in many cases, you could have what's called a vacuum breaker here, where if pressure was lost, it would be impossible to siphon through the individual unit. Sometimes those are still required, but they wouldn't be required or necessary if there was a backflow preventer 
for the home system or for the commercial system. This is just another visual of that idea of surge arresters, specifically looking at them as a product. I mentioned that these are surge arresters um, that can contain a column of air. This shows you what it looks like inside that column of air. So where the water shuts off rapidly, the water continues to move, it compresses the air, and that works as a shock absorber and re removes that noisy water hammer effect that can come from shutting off fixtures too quickly. We should have a general idea of what's going on in a hot water tank. Um, the idea is there's all kinds of um, efficiencies that can be purchased or designed into these. In this case, the one on the left has a um, an atmospheric uh, power venting system, so it's more efficient. It doesn't require a through-the-roof chimney system for its gases to escape, um, and it can shut off the gases from escaping once the the, um, the natural gas is done firing at the bottom of the tank, so it can conserve energy. Um, but we have, you know, um, what looks like a, a very busy view of plumbing around it, but um, typically we have a gas line supplying gas, natural gas to the appliance. In this case, it looks a little bit on the sloppy side. Here we have a flexible gas line going to the, to the um, thermostatic valve or the hot water tank. And then at the top, we have hot and cold water coming in and then being distributed to various uh, places within the, within the building. Inside of our hot water tank, we have the combustion chamber and it, um, the combustion hot gases go up through the center of the water tank and they exchange their gas heat with the water. Um, and these aren't necessarily very efficient systems, um, but they're very dependable. Um, they're the old, they're very old design, um, well understood, um, relatively inexpensive devices, but they're about 70% efficient. We've moved to uh, tankless hot water tanks or heaters in uh, recent times. We still have a natural gas supply, a hot and cold water inlet, um, and then uh, venting, natural gas, the combustion airs are vented out of these devices. One of the advantages, obviously, is they take up less space. They look better. They could be in a room without being, um, you know, like a laundry room. Um, and they're very efficient. Um, they burn... Um, intermittently, and they burn only as much as they need to heat the water in um, usually what's considered an instantaneous way. So there's no what is called standby losses. With hot water tanks, the whole tank of water is always at temperature and it's always losing heat to the environment. And so we do provide insulation around them, but we still lose that heat sometimes to where we don't want it. So here's a look at that, and I probably should have gone to this right away. This, um, this idea of what it looks like inside. So we have our water supplies, a fan to move the combustion air up and out, and then we exchange the, the water right away with the combustion air. So it's a, much, um, it, it's a much more compact system, but it is more complex. Therefore, um, you get more efficiencies, but the unit cost is probably four times that of a hot water tank. So sometimes recovering the cost of saving energy is outweighed, or the cost of the unit outweighs the savings and energy in certain applications. It's important for architects to understand that sizing of the waste lines from our, our, um, our plumbing system is based on this idea of fixture units. Um, so a bathtub, a lavatory, shower, they all have fixture units that um, aggregate to tell what size trap needs to go and what size drain needs to go with that specific appliance. And they all aggregate to tell us what our final sizes of plumbing um, should be. So um, be aware of this term fixture units and, um, and the idea of adding them up in order to size our plumbing systems. Water pressure for high-rise buildings or multi-story buildings, probably more of an issue with us now. We're starting to move up over two stories, and pressure drops can start to become significant. Um, but uh, be aware that um, water pressure entering at 60 PSI, by the time it's at the third level, it's at 46 PSI. So in multi-unit arrangements, somebody pulling a heavy load of water on the first floor can seriously affect the water pressure on the third floor. And the last thing is, 
Um, even though you may not have to re make a ADA compatible um, bathroom in buildings um, because it's a private residence, there are still minimums of fixture clearances that are required by code. So I think this is a really handy graphic. I think this would be important if you're involved in designing tiny houses or very small spaces and trying to create the smallest footprint of a bathroom facility that you might be able to. And these are these are the requirements by code. This comes right out of uh, one of the building codes. So that wraps up our plumbing section.